So it's the great honor to have Edward Wittin as the first speaker of this the APSTP colloquium series. Uh, probably Edward Wittin uh, Ed, uh, does not need any introduction. Uh, he is uh, he he's uh, the string theory legend, and he has an enormous contributor to the field theory, the string theory, and the mathematical physics. Uh, he has been uh, the faculty of the Institute for Advanced Study and uh, now the emeritus, uh, emeritus faculty at the Institute. Uh, all of these string theorists were the student of the, of the ed because uh, we should read every paper of his. And so particularly he, award, he was awarded the Field Medal in 1990 and uh, Fundamental Physics Prize uh, in uh, 2012. Uh, so uh, he will talk about the algebras and entropies for black holes and based the space. So please, Ed. Well, thank you very much for the kind introduction and for the invitation to give this talk at this colloquium series. So my talk will really have two parts. Since it is a colloquium, uh, I'm going to begin with a general introduction to black hole thermodynamics. Some of you uh, in the audience may well know many aspects of the subject better than I do, but to others, it might be quite unfamiliar. So in the first half of the talk, I'll try to explain the ideas of black hole thermodynamics without very many assumptions. In the second half, I'll give an overview of some more recent developments, uh, basically the two papers I've indicated there. Because time is somewhat limited, I'll give an overview of the ideas. I won't go into all the formulas. I do want to remark that these papers were inspired by two papers written last fall by Hong Liu and his student Samuel Weyreiser. <clears throat> So black hole thermodynamics is just about half a century old. It started with the work of Jacob Bekenstein, who was inspired by questions from his advisor, John Wheeler, and he asked what the second law of thermodynamics means in the presence of a black hole. So the second law for an ordinary system says that the entropy can only increase. But if we toss a cup of tea into a a black hole, the entropy seems to disappear. Bakkenstein wanted to generalize the concept of entropy so that, so that the second law would hold even in the presence of a black hole. So he wanted to assign an entropy to a black hole in such a way that entropy would always increase, not just in the absence of black holes. Well, what property of a black hole can only increase? Your first thought might be that the black hole mass can only increase because the black hole can absorb matter, but at least classically, it can't emit matter. However, that's actually not correct. Even classically, it's not true that the black hole mass always increases. For example, if a black hole is rotating and you send in matter with opposite angular momentum, you can slow down the rotation of the black hole. And when you slow down its rotation, the black hole loses mass. In fact, something somewhat like that is believed to power the jets that come from centers of galaxies. But there is a quantity that always increases. Stephen Hawking had just proved the area theorem, which says that the area of the horizon of a black hole can only increase. So it was fairly natural for Bekenstein to propose that the entropy of a black hole should be a multiple of the horizon area. For example, I've written the metric for a Schwarzschild black hole of mass m. The horizon is at r equals two gm, and the area is four pi r squared, which is 16 pi g squared m squared. So that's the horizon area of a Schwarzschild black hole of mass m. A short shield black hole is simply an unrotating neutral black hole. And therefore, Bekenstein conjectured that the entropy of a short shield black hole is a multiple of m squared. Since entropy is dimensionless, to relate the entropy of a black hole to its area, one requires a constant of proportionality with dimensions of area. 
from the fundamental constants h bar c and g, which is Newton constant, you can make the Planck length LP and the Planck area LP squared. These definitions were originally made by Planck who observed that the natural length he could define was something incredibly small. So basically, Beckenstein said that the um, entropy would be the area over LP squared. Or in units with C equals one, you could write it as I have here. The entropy is the area over 4G times H bar. Well, Beckenstein really did not know the constant one quarter. That constant was discovered, explained by Hawking a few years later in the way that I will describe. Beckenstein simply said that the entropy was some universal multiple of A over GH bar. Now, I usually said H bar to one, but the reason I didn't in this formula was that including the H bar there helps explain why black hole entropy is so large in ordinary terms. For example, the entropy of a black hole with the mass of the sun is roughly 10 to the 20 times the mass of the actual sun. And that has to do with the one over H bar in the denominator. So for a short chilled black hole, um, well, with the, with the aid of Hawking's refinement, Beckenstein's formula reads like so. <clears throat> now Beckenstein defined a generalized entropy, which was supposed to be the entry S out. S out is the entry of ordinary marital radiation outside the black hole, plus this new entropy, the area over 4GH bar. And Beckenstein proposed a generalized second law according to which the generalized entropy always increases. So you can throw a cup of tea into the black hole and when you do that, S out goes down, but the black hole increases in mass and therefore it increases in area. And for the special case of throwing a cup of tea into the black hole, you can easily estimate that the increase in A over four GH bar is much more than the decrease of S out. So Beckenstein proposed that in the presence of a black hole, the generalized entropy, well, the second law should be interpreted as a statement that the generalized entropy always increases. Now, Stephen Hawking supposedly was skeptical of Beckenstein's idea and set out to disprove it by citing the behavior of a quantum field interacting with a black hole. But he ended up proving it instead of disproving it. And I want to give a short explanation of what Hawking did. In doing so, I'm going to make use of a schematic picture of a black hole space time that's called a Penrose diagram. In a Penrose diagram, you just, it's most useful for a spherically symmetric black hole, like the sh short shield black hole. In a Penrose diagram, you only depict the two important dimensions. You suppress the angles where there are symmetries that change the angles. You keep only the time and also the radial distance from the center of the black hole. So in this picture, time runs vertically and space runs horizontally, but space is really the distance from the center of the black hole. I called it space, but we could think of it as radial distance. But there's a trick that Penrose introduced, which is very useful, which is to make a conformal mapping. You don't actually depict the geometry of the black hole in detail. You make a conformal mapping to move infinity to a finite place where you can see it and talk about it more easily. But importantly, you do that by conformal mapping so that light rays travel at a 45 degree angle, a pi over two angle to the vertical. So in the Penrose diagram, a signal traveling no faster than light is never going at an angle bigger than pi over two from the vertical. So in this picture, past infinity is down here. Future infinity where an observer will be collecting signals coming from the black hole is up here. And the far future of future infinity is right up around here. 
And this black line, which is meant to be at a pi over four angle from the vertical, though I didn't draw it very carefully, is the black hole horizon. If you're outside the horizon, at an angle less than pi over four from the vertical, you can reach future infinity where the observer lives. And you can meet an observer who's outside the black hole. This wiggly line here is the black hole singularity. Anything that reaches it gets crushed. If you're behind the horizon, even trying to escape at the speed of light, which remember means a pi over four angle from the vertical, you'll end up crushed at the singularity. Finally, this red region is the portion of space time occupied by the star that collapsed to make the black hole. So that's the basic picture. Many of you will already be familiar with Penrose diagrams, many not. If you're not, I hope I've said enough to make the next few minutes of the talk more or less understandable. So we're going to consider the measurements that will be made by an observer who stays outside the black hole in the far future. So the far future means up here. In the Penrose diagram, the time of an outside observer goes to infinity at this corner up there. So if you ask what you would see if you stay outside, well, first of all, if you stay outside the black hole, you'll end up at this point up here. And if you ask while staying outside the black hole, what will you see at very late times? That's a question about the measurements that you'll make near this corner in the diagram. So that's why we're going to focus on that corner and what would be seen by an observer at that corner. So the measurements that you would make at future infinity up here can be traced back to initial data on an initial surface, a Cauchy surface, which could be, for example, this one that I've indicated in blue over here. So imagine for the quantum fields inside and outside the black hole horizon, we describe them by initial data on this blue surface. And whatever the initial data are, it propagates, part of the signal will propagate to infinity where the observer can see it out here, and part will propagate to the black hole singularity. But we're going to ask what you see when you're outside the black hole at very late times. So here I've drawn the same thing again, but I've added some purple diagonal lines over here. They're meant to be at a pi over four angle from the vertical, and they're meant to depict light rays escaping to infinity. Escaping to infinity means that they reach this black line up here. So in this Penrose diagram, they're parallel to the horizon, but they have the crucial difference that they reach in they reach the region of the outside observer. The horizon does not. You have to remember that the Penrose diagram is a conformal picture. So an infinite amount of time is elapsing in this little corner up here. The whole future infinity, if you're sitting outside the black hole making observations, all everything you will, all the signals you'll receive up to time infinity will reach you in just this little bit up here. So now we ask, what will an observer sitting outside the black hole see? Part of Hawking's insight was that although the full details of exactly what the observer will see depend on the details of the collapsing star, if we ask what the observer will see in the far future after transients die down, then there's a universal answer. Uh, excuse me, yeah. uh, there is, was one question in the chat team. Yeah. So, yeah, is, is the blue surface uniquely defined? No, the blue surface, it would have been better if I, I should have drawn the blue surface a little differently. It would have been better if I drawn it so it escaped, went down here for technical reasons. The blue surface, in general, in relativity, you could, you could pick any space-like surface and define initial data on that surface. 
the only important thing about the blue curve is that it's to the future of the collapsing star. What that means is that it crosses the horizon after the star has already gone by. So the part of the blue surface that will be important is this part near the horizon. And that part is outside the collapsing star. The collapsing star was drawn in red. So what I'm doing when I draw the blue surface, the star has collapsed. And then we're going to ask what happened, what we see maybe if we're outside at, at infinity, what we'll see maybe a year later. But then just one day after the collapse, I erect this blue surface. So what we'll see a year later is determined by initial data a day later. So, um, well, you'll see, I'll make that a little bit clearer um, in, a, in about a page or two. But the quick answer to your question is that no, the blue surface is any in any space-like surface that's outside the cloud, that intersects the horizon after the star has already gone by. That means it intersects the horizon over here, which is to the future of where the horizon intersected the star down there. Uh, and sorry for a basic question. Yes. But is this the expansion uh, of Lorentz diagram? Hold on, hold on right? a second. I'm going to clarify something. The point is that this region here is essentially vacuum because we've waited till everything has fallen into the black hole from a classical point of view. So a classical physicist would say there's nothing here. The important part of thing about the blue surface is just that we waited till all the matter fell into the black hole. So that's the, the red region is the region where the matter is. So out here, we're essentially have got empty space from a classical point of view. Go ahead with your question. Uh, uh, is this expansion of Lorentz diagram, right? It's called a Penrose diagram. Oh, yeah, yeah I know. Mm, I ah, then I will search it later. Thanks. Sure. So Hawking discovered that although the full details of exactly what an outside observer will see depend on the details of the collapsing star, if you ask what the observer will see in the far future after transients die down, there's a universal answer. The most important point about the picture is that a signal that's received very late, which means way up here, originated from very close to the horizon. See, if you get a signal here, it came from very close to the horizon down here. In the Penrose diagram, distances have been stretched so that a lot of time is elapsing here, but only a, a divergent infinite amount of time is elapsing when you go up to this corner. But as you cross the horizon, there's only a finite amount of space involved. And it's that stretching which is going to lead to the Hawking effect. So because of the fact that a signal received very late comes from very close to the horizon, it means that observations made at late times amount to measurements of the state of the quantum fields at short distances. But every state is equivalent to the vacuum at short distances. This statement is one of the most fundamental facts in quantum field theory. Since every state is equivalent to the vacuum at short distances, the observer who makes a late time measurement outside of the black hole is simply observing the vacuum near the black hole horizon. So the late time observations probe the vacuum near the horizon at short distances, irrespective of what the black hole formed from or what, how it was made. That's why Hawking got a universal answer for the late time behavior, regardless of how the black hole formed. So now I'm going to very briefly explain the essence of his calculation. So we're going to let u be a coordinate function that vanishes on the horizon on some particular Cauchy slice. The precise definition of U doesn't matter. 
In this picture, I'm just drawing the important part of the picture. Now in red, it used to be blue, is a, a bit of a Cauchy slice, but I've drawn the important bit, which is the part just outside the horizon. I'm leaving out the rest of it. U is a function that's positive on this red curve, but zero at the horizon. Its derivative is non-zero at the horizon, but otherwise I don't care about it. T is the time measured by an outside observer. As I've told you a few times, it goes to infinity up here. At that point. So U is the spatial position where the signal is emitted. T is the time at which the signal is detected. The relation between T and U is this one. which you find by solving the geodesic equation for an outgoing null geodesic in the black hole spacetime. Now you can see that the precise definition of u doesn't matter. If you rescale u, that just adds a constant to the time. And I didn't tell you what was the zero of time for an outside observer anyway. If you make a nonlinear redefinition of u, that will only affect the order U terms that will not be important. Now, when I say that T is four GM times the log of one over U, the fact that T is logarithmically big when U is small might not sound so stupendous. But if you solve the equation for U in terms of T, it looks much more dramatic. You find what I've written here, you learn that if you make an observation at a time t, it was emitted at a distance u from the horizon, which is exponentially small if t is large. And t does not have to be very large. For a black hole with the mass of the sun, if t is a millisecond, this, the exponent is a couple hundred. So u is the exponential of minus 100 or something less than that in natural units. So after a very short time in human terms, we're in the late time regime where U is exponentially small. Moreover, du dt is equally small. So a mode observed at infinity has undergone an exponentially large redshift on its way. That means that if you have a detector which is detecting outgoing particles of energy E, for some fixed E, and it doesn't matter what E is, no matter what kind of energies your detector is tuned to detect, the modes you detect at a sufficiently late time will have originated from very high energy modes near the horizon. That's why there's a simple answer. A mode of very high energy propagates freely along these light-like geodesics the lines at pi over four angle to the vertical that I keep drawing. Now let's imagine an observer at infinity that probes the radiation by measuring a quantum field psi of t. In the real world, psi might be the electric or magnetic field. The radiation might be photons. But in general, in any case, the observer is measuring some kind of quantum field psi of t. A typical observable you might measure is a two-point function in the radiation field. Near the horizon, a typical quantum field has the power-like singularity. For instance, if our quantum field is a two-dimensional free fermion, then there's a simple pole at u equals u prime. And we can take that as an example. Um, it's the right singularity for a certain S-wave mode in four dimensions. Setting u equals a constant times e to the minus t over 4gm. And just rewriting this formula in terms of t, we find that the observer at infinity will measure this two-point function for the field psi. And now we have the essence of the Hawking effect. This is anti-periodic in imaginary time. It's odd under shifting t by eight pi gm times i. i is the square root of minus one. The anti-periodicity corresponds to a thermal correlation function at a temperature one over eight pi gm, which is the Hawking temperature. 
I got anti-periodicity because I assumed we were studying a fermion. If it had been a boson, we would have had a double pole and we would have gotten periodicity of the same temperature. So in other words, a black hole after transients that depends on how it was created die down, radiates thermally at a temperature one over eight pi gm, known today as the Hawking temperature. What I've explained is actually pretty close to Hawking's original calculation, as slightly improved by later authors. Now we can find the entropy using dE equals TDS, where e, for the energy E, we take the black hole mass M, and for the temperature T, we take the Hawking temperature 1 over 8 pi gm. We learned that dS is 8 pi g times m dm, so S is 4 pi g m squared. Well, I assumed a Schwarzschild black hole somewhere. Well, okay, no. In the formulas I've used, I assumed a Schwarzschild black hole. Its area, as we computed before, is 16 pi g squared m squared. So the entropy is A over 4g. And so this is how Hawking confirmed Bekenstein's conjecture that the entropy is a multiple of area over g, and also determined that the coefficient is one quarter. This is a good time maybe to ask if there are any more questions. Could you go back to the slide where you have the expression for the correlation function for the size? Yes, so uh, this du du prime to the half by u minus u prime, this seems to be dimensionless. Well, it... Psi has dimension one half physically. Okay, I've written, a, uh, first of all, I've written a formula for a two dimensional free fermion. Any quantum field would have a power like singularity and would lead to something similar to what I said. Here I wrote a two dimensional free fermion. Okay, du is, okay. You could say that uh, perhaps I should have written the formula in terms of psi times du to the one half. The reason I wanted to include the du to the one half is that it's easier. The change of variables from u to t is more straightforward if we include the du du prime to make it dimensionless. So, see the units. If you if you define psi to have dimension to one half, since it's dimensionful, you have to worry about what are what are the dimensions in which an observer would measure it. And there's a redshifting in the natural units of mass from the horizon to infinity. Um, by making the formula dimensionless, I avoided ha having to go into some details. But you could say that I should have had a du du prime to one half on the left hand side of the formula also. I, I haven't cheated. I, I haven't cheated, but I've simplified the explanation a little bit. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I, I have very stupid questions. So somehow you shuffled the things and uh, oh, oh, not you, Hawking, find out this, uh, this factor four. Uh, I cannot fully follow, but uh, can you give us some more transparent or, or physical explanation about the origin of, of factor four? Or, well, the, the, the factor of four, you only find if you calculate carefully. What I think I, is more interesting is why the black hole is radiating thermally. The, the essence of why the black hole radiates thermally is that there are two facts you need to know. See. One is the relation between the time at which you make an observation and the distance from the horizon at which the signal came. So this is one key fact. Uh -huh. so this is a geometrical fact about black holes. But if you calculate uh, one dimensional black hole or two dimensional black hole, still you have same factor four or you have different factor? Well, it depends on what conventions you use for writing the Einstein action in different dimensions. With some uh -huh. conventions, you'd always get a four. Uh -huh. 
but it really is somewhat convention dependent. I would say the important thing though, first of all, this exponential relationship between the distance from the horizon that the signal came and the time at which you observe it. That's one important fact. Mm -hmm. The second important fact is that quantum fields have power like singularities. I wrote an example, but at short distances there's always a power like singularity. I just mm -hmm. wrote a simple example to minimize mm -hmm. the explanations. Then if you change variables from U to T using that exponential relationship between U and T, this mm -hmm. magically turns into this. Mm -hmm. which you might recognize as a standard formula for a thermal correlation function. Mm -hmm. If it's not, if the formula isn't familiar, you can just observe it's anti-periodic in imaginary time. Right. Yeah. For bosons, it would have been periodic in imaginary time. Right. And that means it's thermal. So the temperature, uh -huh. so this is how you determine the temperature. The temperature comes from the periodicity in imaginary time. Of course, to get a number, you had to get the correct constant. Right. In this previous formula. That's elementary, but it's a small calculation you have to do with the black hole. Yeah, you can actually, this formula, the, re the relation between U and T looks like a thermal relationship or Boltzmann factor. It's right? exponential, but T is time, not energy. But yeah, maybe. But at the end, you, you interpret T as a, yeah. some temperature. So it's exactly the parallel mm -hmm. to Boltzmann factor, if you well, interpret T as a temperature. But it's not, well, T is, well, this is a real time correlation function. So T is really real time. Uh -huh. So it's a real time correlation function, but it's periodic and imaginary time. So that's the property that real time thermal correlation functions have. Uh -huh. So. Okay. See. Okay. So, you see, if, if you All take right. trace, it, what is a real time thermal correlation function? Right. It's something like this. That's right. And by by familiar arguments, it's periodic and imaginary time with period i beta. Right. Periodic or anti periodic for bosons or fermions. Mm -hmm. So here we got something which is anti periodic and imaginary time. And that tells us it has a thermal interpretation. Mm -hmm. T is time. But we discover that there's a temperature. Well, from this, we learned that beta is one over HEM. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. I'm forgetting a two pi, I guess. I hope I got that right. Yeah. I think I might have put the two pi in the wrong place, but anyway, you got the idea. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But sorry, another question is usually in, in, uh, in uh, summer physics, periodic, periodic uh, relationship is, is connected to boson and anti-periodicity yeah. is related to fermion. Yeah. Here, do yes, you have yes. such a rela rela relationship? Yes. Uh, I wrote a correlator for a fermion, but for a boson, there would be a double pole uh -huh. and everything would be squared and then it would be periodic instead of antiperiodic. Uh -huh. It's all, well, I'm cutting many corners to give it a simple and short explanation, but yeah. the beauty of Hawking's derivation was that he uh -huh. got completely sensible thermal physics from this calculation. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. I want to ask a question. Yes. What's the difference? What's the uh, relation between the two different uh, der derivation of Hawking's temperature? One is the uh, imaginary time. Another is the uh, Hawking's orange derivation, which is quantize the field on covered space time. Well, Hawking's original derivation is essentially what I've explained. I think the relationship is that the exponential that we got, the exponential that we got, when we have this u equals e to the minus something times t, that formula was periodic for t in imaginary time. 
And that periodicity is related to the fact that the Euclidean black hole is periodic in imaginary time, which is the Gibbons Hawking derivation. I'm reluctant though to try to answer you in detail because there isn't time to explain the, the Euclidean derivation today. And since the, this is a colloquium and many people on the talk are probably not too familiar with the Euclidean derivation. So I don't, without time to explain it, I don't want to say too much about it. So I'll just limit myself to saying that I think the basic bridge between them is that the exponential that we had, exactly. where the derivation came from is that, that this formula, I forget what C was, but that formula is periodic and imaginary T. And that's the, that periodicity is the germ of what Hawking and Gibbons did. Uh, any other questions? Um, so I may I ask a short question? Yeah. Yes. So uh, at, the, at the end, uh, you equated the E equal to, uh, to M or E equal to M, right? Whereas the photon, the quantum field is originated from the vacuum. Could you comment a little bit on that? Is that okay? The quantum field outside the black hole was in the vacuum. The, yes, but nonetheless, your energy is equal to the mass of the black uh, hole. When we, when we use this formula, we're now talking about the whole system. So we have to talk about the total energy of the system, whatever it is. Right. Okay. I think I'll go on. So, Soon after Hawking had done this calculation, Gibbons and Hawking considered another situation with horizons, here cosmology rather than black hole physics, and proposed that also the area of a cosmological horizon is a kind of entropy. More specifically, they assigned a temperature and an entropy to the region of de Sitter space accessible to an observer. Well, what is de Sitter space? The Sitter space may be a good approximation to what our universe will be in about 10 to the 11 years. The Sitter space is the maximally symmetric solution of Einstein's equations with a positive cosmological constant. So the metric is what I've written here. And you see that if T is positive, this metric ex expands exponentially in T. It would also expand exponentially as t goes to minus infinity, but usually we think of that as exponential contraction. Our present universe is, believe, appears to be entering a period of exponential expansion, which if so can be modeled by the positive t part of de Sitter space. And an observer in de Sitter space therefore could be us, or at least our progeny in 10 to the 10 years if they manage to survive. Because of the exponential expansion, other galaxies in the real world will all be out of sight within roughly 10 to the 11 years, unless they're gravitationally bound to the Milky Way. They'll be behind the cosmological horizon. So again, I've drawn here a Penrose diagram, which is a way to depict <clears throat> the causal relations in the Sitter space, where again, you show only two dire directions. One of them is time, and the other is roughly distance from the observer. In drawing the diagram, we pick coordinates so that the observer's world line is on the left boundary of the picture. The blue line is, the, is infinite future, t equals plus infinity up here. The blue line down here is t equals minus infinity. The diagonal, it's again true that causal signals, light rays, anything moving no faster than light, is at most at a 45 degree angle from the vertical. So the diagonal red lines represent light rays, but those particular light rays are the past and future horizons of the observer. The observer cannot see anything which is beyond this future horizon. So a signal out here, traveling no faster than light will somehow reach time infinity, but will never reach the observer. So the observer can't see anything to the future of the future horizon and can't influence anything to the past of the past horizon. The green region, which is called a static patch, I can't remember if I wrote that. 
the green region um, is, which is, okay, the green region, which is called a static patch. I think I'll use that terminology a little later. Is the region causally accessible to the observer? It's the region that the observer can see and also can influence. So Gibbons and Hawking attributed to the cosmological horizon an entropy, again, the area over 4G and a corresponding temperature. The temperature had actually been defined earlier. The meaning of the de Sitter entropy has been a mystery ever since. Now, many researchers have thought that somehow the entropy A over 4G means that the black hole or the cosmological horizon can be described by some sort of degrees of freedom that live at its surface with one bit or qubit for every 4G of area. For example, here's a famous picture that John Wheeler drew in an article published in 1992. This is 20 years after Beckenstein's work. Remember, Beckenstein had been Wheeler's student. Although I don't know, I wouldn't be surprised if Wheeler had been drawing this picture for 20 years. Anyway, he visualized the black hole horizon divided into little cells with area one over 4G. And he imagined uh, a bit or qubit in each little cell. To, well, he's drawn it as zeros or ones, but it's meant to usually describes that the zeros and ones result from measure, measuring a spin, for example. The term qubit hadn't yet been coined, but measuring what we now call a qubit. So Wheeler's picture roughly is that there's a qubit in every unit area of the black hole. And that's why the entropy is proportional to the area. Well, that was 1992. More modern understanding involves understanding what entropy means in quantum mechanics at a more fundamental level. As a preliminary, let's review entropy classically. The original definition goes back to Boltzmann and then Gibbs and others of the 19th and early 20th century. Consider a system of n particles in a box with positions x and momentum p. As a classical physicist, Boltzmann assumed that at a given time, x and p have definite values, even if we don't know them. Then you can describe the state of your knowledge by a probability distribution function, rho of p and x. And after great labor, Boltzmann and followers such as Gibbs defined the entropy as the phase space integral of minus rho log rho. So this is a classical formula for the entropy. What's its quantum analog? The, the quantum analog of the classical density function is the, is the density matrix rho of a quantum system. It has the property that for any operator rho, the expectation value of rho in a given state is the trace of rho times the density matrix. In general, rho is a positive self-adjoint operator of trace one. So if you take Boltzmann's or Gibbs's integral, I've written Boltzmann's, but I think it's really more Gibbs who wrote the entropy in this form. The phase space integral dp dx corresponds to a trace and rho corresponds to rho. So the quantum analog of the Boltzmann-Gibbs definition of entropy is the von Neumann entropy of a density matrix minus the trace of rho log rho. In the classical limit, the von Neumann entropy goes over to the classical entropy while also fixing an additive constant that's poorly defined classically. For a system in thermal equilibrium, the von Neumann entropy agrees with the thermodynamic entropy. But importantly, the von Neumann entropy is always defined for any quantum system, whether it's in thermal equilibrium or not. There's a basic difference between the two cases. Classical entropy measures our lack of knowledge about the microscopic state of a system. The quantum analog does measure lack of knowledge, but it also measures entanglement 
between the system of interest and some other system. So for example, if we consider a bipartite system AB with a tensor product Hilbert space HAB, even if the overall system is in a pure state psi AB, the subsystem A is typically in a mixed state described by a reduced density matrix that you get by taking the trace over system B. And it will then have a non-zero von Neumann entropy, which in this case is called entanglement entropy because it arises from entanglement with some other system. The idea that the Beckenstein Hawking entropy of a black hole is entanglement entropy apparently goes back to Raphael Sorkin in 1983. The idea was just the following. In a quantum field theory, divide space into two regions, A and B. In Sorkin's application, B is the region behind the black hole horizon, A is the region outside. But for some general remarks, A and B could be anything. Let psi be a state of the system and let rho A be the reduced density matrix of the state psi for measurements in region A. Well, you can then try to calculate the von Neumann entropy and Sorkin and later Sorkin Bombelli et al. tried to do this and ran into an ultraviolet divergence. One finds that the entanglement entropy has an ultraviolet divergence independent of psi and the coefficient of the leading divergence is a multiple of the area A between, of the boundary between the two regions. In modern language, Sorkin's idea was that somehow gravity cuts off the divergence, leaving an entanglement entropy in the vacuum. That's the Beckenstein Hawking entropy A over 4G, where A is the area of the boundary between them. That makes a lot of intuitive sense as it matches two ideas. The first, which was Sorkin's motivation, is that A over 4G is the irreducible entropy of the system for someone who has access only to the region outside the horizon. So Sorkin tried to interpret it as the entropy of the density matrix outside the horizon. Second, the divergence in the entanglement entropy is proportional to the area because it comes from short wavelength modes near the horizon. As if after cutting off the divergence, the density of quantum degrees of freedom on the horizon per unit area is a multiple of 4G as in Wheeler's picture. Now, Soskind and Oglum, a decade after Sorkin, made a simple observation that strongly supports the idea of interpreting S out as entanglement entropy. Remember that Beckenstein had defined the generalized entropy, area over 4G H bar plus S out. If you interpret S out as von Neumann entropy, then the generalized entropy is better defined than either term is separately. The second term S out has an ultraviolet divergence that Sorkin had noted. But the first term has a similar problem because there's an ultraviolet divergence in the relationship between the bare Newton constant G naught and the physical observed Newton constant G. In one loop order, the relation looks like this. So I sketched for you before Hawking's calculation, but Hawking wasn't computing quantum mechanical loops. So the Newton's constant in Hawking's calculation was presumably the bare Newton constant G naught. And when you try to express Hawking's calculation, Hawking's answer in real world terms, you want to express it in terms of one over G, but there's an ultraviolet divergence in the relationship between one over G and one over G naught. Soskind and Uglin made the beautiful observation that the divergence, the one that the divergence in S out cancels the divergence in one over G. And these arguments have held up and they've been improved by later authors. Now, 21st century developments have strongly supported these ideas, though leaving us with plenty of mysteries. In the available time, I'm going to talk about just one aspect of the story. Why is it that entanglement entropy is ill-defined in quantum field theory? 
so that S out has that quadratic divergence that Sorkin discovered. But entanglement entropy is well-defined once gravity is included because the ultraviolet divergences cancel out in the generalized entropy. Well, first of all, in ordinary quantum mechanics, when you consider entanglement between two systems, A and B, you usually assume at the start that each system has its own Hilbert space, HA or HB. The combined system then has a tensor product Hilbert space, HA tensor HB. A state psi AB in this space might be a simple tensor product of state psi A and psi B. In that case, systems A and B separately can be described by pure states, namely psi A and psi B. And there's no entanglement entropy. But a more generic state is something more like this. And for a state of that kind, we say that systems A and B are entangled. And in that case, system A, for example, has a density matrix of rank bigger than one and it has a positive von Neumann entropy. The point of what I just explained is that in ordinary quantum mechanics, whether or not a state has a non-zero entanglement and entanglement entropy is a property of the state. That's so elementary that we usually take it for granted. But that's not so for entanglement entropy between different regions in quantum field theory. So in Sorkin's situation, the divergence that he found was an ultraviolet divergence. So it does not depend on the state. Every state looks like the vacuum at short distances. That was the essence of Hawking's calculation or part of it. The root of the problem is that it's not true in quantum field theory that there are separate Hilbert spaces HA and HB for inside and outside regions. There's only a combined Hilbert space curly H for the whole system. What the separate regions A and B have are not Hilbert spaces HA and HB, but only algebras of observables curly A and curly B. These algebras act on the Hilbert space so they can be defined to be von Neumann algebras, which is essentially just a fancy name for an algebra of bounded operators on the Hilbert space. <clears throat> there are three broad types of von Neumann algebra. A type one algebra is the algebra of all operators on the Hilbert space. In ordinary quantum mechanics, when we discuss the system A, it has a Hilbert space HA, and the algebra of observables of the system is the algebra of all operators on HA. So that algebra is of type one. So a type one von Neumann algebra is what we take for granted in ordinary quantum mechanics. If a system is described by a type one algebra A, then the system can have quantum mechanical pure states, namely states in the Hilbert space on which A is the algebra of observables. In this situation, we also have density matrices and entropies. After all, type one is just ordinary quantum mechanics. The other types are less familiar. But before I explain what they are, I'll just tell you the bottom line. A type two algebra does not have pure states, but there is a notion of density matrix and entropy for a system whose algebra of observables is of type two. A type three algebra is the worst type. A system whose observables form a type three algebra does not have pure states and also does not have density matrices or entropies. But now you might anticipate the bad news. In quantum field theory, the algebra of observables of a region of space-time, as in Sorkin's picture, is always of type three. This is a result that's due originally to Arbaki in the mid 1960s. So it's even older than black hole thermodynamics. Because the algebra is of type three, 
to a region one can never associate a pure state or a density matrix or entropy. The type three nature of the algebra is an abstract explanation for the universal ultraviolet divergence of the entanglement entropy. However, it turns out that including gravity in a semi classical way changes the picture. At least in the case of the black hole or desider space, including gravity semi classically changes the algebra of the region outside the horizon from type three to type two. Uh, so, so I should say that including gravity semi-classically means that G is arbitrarily small. So G can be asymptotically small, no matter how small G is, including gravity changes the algebra of the region outside the horizon from type three to type two. I don't know what would happen if you could include gravity exactly. And I don't know for sure whether there's a similar answer in more general space times with horizons. For now, it's only a statement about the black hole or the sitter space. So when gravity is turned on semi-classically, the region outside the black hole or the sitter horizon is described by an algebra in which the notion of entropy is well-defined, though there's no notion of a quantum mechanical microstate. We can interpret this as a somewhat abstract answer to the question of why including gravity suddenly enabled us to convert the ill-defined divergent S out into the better defined generalized entropy. Including gravity turned the type three algebra into a type two algebra. And that brought us into a world where density matrices exist and entropies are well-defined. But to understand how this works, we need to understand something about these von Neumann algebras of types two and three. They can be most simply described as the algebras that act on certain thermal systems. Let me explain how that works. A finite thermal system A with Hamiltonian H and inverse temperature beta has a density matrix of the usual thermal form, where Z is such that the trace of the density matrix is one. Now, roughly speaking, the thermal field double is a pure state of a larger system with density matrix rho beta. For a finite system, we simply introduce a second copy of the original system with an identical Hamiltonian. And then if psi i, are the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian and the energies are EI, the thermal field double state is defined by this formula. And it has the property that the corresponding density matrix is the thermal density matrix rho, e to the minus beta h over z. So psi TFD is sometimes called the canonical purification of the thermal density matrix. Now for an infinite system, this definition of psi TFD is usually not well-defined because Z is infinity and the sum doesn't converge. But it turns out that psi does in an appropriate sense have a thermodynamic limit. But funny things happen to the algebra of observables in the thermodynamic limit. That's where algebras of type two and type three come in. The simplest case is that the Hamiltonian is zero. Consider a system A of n qubits with Hamiltonian zero. The partition function is two to the n and the thermal field double state with zero Hamiltonian is just a completely entangled state of system A completely entangled with the second system B also consisting of n qubits. So the n little nth qubit of system A is completely entangled with the little nth qubit of system B. <clears throat> so the nth qubit of the first system is completely entangled with the nth qubit in the second. 
Now let A and A prime be operators that act only on the first K spins or qubits of system A, where K is no bigger than capital N. I'm going to take N to infinity, but I keep the operators fixed. So the operators act on a fixed set of qubits, let's say K of them, but N is going to infinity. <clears throat> Define a function F of A, which is the exhortation value of A in the state Psi. Well, you see, this is going to be the trace of A times rho, where rho is the density matrix. But I arrange so that the system is thermal with Hamiltonian zero, which means that rho is uh, a multiple of the identity. Because rho is a multiple of the identity, this function f of a is a multiple of the trace of a, if you regard. So. <clears throat> and since it's a multiple of the trace, it satisfies the important property that if you have two operators, a and a prime, then f of a, a prime equals f of a prime a. It satisfies f of one equals one because psi was normalized. This factor here is chosen so psi is normalized so that the exponential value of the identity is one. So f of one is one, f of a, a prime is f of a prime a. And this is the last crucial property. f of a has a thermodynamic limit because it's independent of n as long as n is equal to or bigger than k. In other words, if you have an operator that acts on the first k qubits, it doesn't matter how many additional qubits there are that the operator doesn't act on. The state is defined in such a way that the adding extra qubits in which the operator doesn't act doesn't change the exponential value of A. So now, therefore, we can take N to infinity. And this function F is still well-defined for all operators that act only in finitely many qubits. So, so far we've defined this function on the whole algebra A naught of operators that act on only finitely many qubits of system A. But then we take the closure in von Neumann sense, which means we allow certain operators that can act on any number K of qubits, but their matrix elements decay rapidly for large K. Taking the closure, we can complete A naught to a von Neumann algebra A, still with a function F of little a, that has the same properties as before. Since f of a, a prime equals f of a prime a, this function is usually called a trace. We formally define f of a to be the trace of a, but the trace of a is not the trace of a in any Hilbert space representation. It's more like a renormalized trace with an infinite factor removed because we removed a factor of two to the n or two, or two to the minus n, where n, two to the n, where n was going to infinity. Well, so we found an infinite dimensional algebra with a trace, but that by itself won't, shouldn't surprise you because you all know a more elementary example. The type one algebra B of all operators on an infinite dimensional Hilbert space H. This again is an algebra with a trace, but with a crucial difference. While we can define a trace for elements of B, it's not defined for all elements, only for those that are trace class. For instance, the identity of B does not have a trace unless you want to allow infinity as a value of the trace. By contrast from the infinite system of qubits, we constructed an algebra A in which every element has a trace. Clearly then it's an essentially new type of algebra. In fact, what I've described is the simplest example of the type two algebra. It's said to be of type two one. It's called the type two one factor of Murray and von Neumann. If A is the type two one algebra that we just constructed and B is the type one algebra of all operators on an infinite dimensional Hilbert space, then we can make a third type of algebra by simply taking their tensor product. So, I define curly C to be A tensor B. 
it still has a trace because each factor does, but it's not defined for all elements because of the factor B. In fact, C is a new kind of algebra said to be of type two infinity. It turns out that A and C are the important types of type two algebras for our applications. C is related to the black hole and A is related to the Sitter space. Well, what would the algebra of type three? So far, we took the Hamiltonian to be zero. If we do the same thing with almost any non-zero Hamiltonian, we're going to get a type three algebra. The simplest case is a Hamiltonian that's the sum of single qubit operators. For instance, this one, where each HI has this simple form. At inverse temperature beta, the ith pair of spins is entangled fully in the sense that the density matrix is invertible, but not maximally in the state that I've indicated here. We can still define a state psi TFD for a system of n qubits by entangling each qubit pair of the A and B systems in this state. Then we can define the function as before, and as before, it has a thermodynamic limit. The important difference is that now f of a a prime is not equal to f of a prime a. For n to infinity, we can define an algebra a naught of operators that act on any finite set of qubits of the A system, and its completion is now a von Neumann algebra of type three. This is an algebra that doesn't have a trace. So it doesn't have entropies or density matrices. Question? Yes. Uh, I, I didn't understand in type three algebra, I didn't understand the F A A prime does not equal to F A prime A. Can you explain more? Well, yeah, I didn't understand yet this part. The, uh, the important well, difference is not here. F of A, it was the exponential of A in the state psi, which is the trace of A times rho. Rho is the density matrix for system A. So in the previous example, rho was a multiple of the identity. Yes. So therefore, F of A is a multiple of the ordinary trace. And the multiple went to infinity in the large n limit, but the function had a limit. So since it, okay. okay. As soon as rho is, is not a multiple of the identity, you're not going to have f of a prime. So the trace of a a prime rho is not equal to the trace of a prime a rho. That's all it is. So as soon as the state is not maximally mixed, the expectation value in the state is not going to be a trace. I see. Is that clear? So the main point to low, low, so the density matrix is not proportional to one. That's the main point? Yes. So I see. The previous case was totally exceptional. The Hamiltonian was zero. It could have been a non-zero C number, but the important thing was that the Hamiltonian was a C number. That's One often considers that case to be too trivial to be worth discussing. But we discussed it and we said something interesting. In the large n limit, we discovered a new algebra, which turns out to be relevant to understanding the Sater space. And, nice. and it's very it's relevant to the black hole. So we did something interesting starting with the Hamiltonian of zero, but it was totally crucial that the Hamiltonian was zero. Any other Hamiltonian, more or less any other Hamiltonian will give a type three algebra. I see, thank you. But this seems to be applicable for quantum mechanics as well. I mean, I don't see why it should be specific to quantum field theories. Yeah. Well, it's, it's also applicable to the thermodynamic limit of statistical mechanics. So in the thermodynamic limit, the algebra of observables is of type three. I'd like to come back to that in the question period. There's something I want to tell you about the thermodynamic limit, but I'm worried about running out of time. So I don't want to say more right now. Okay.
So algebras of type two and type three do not have an irreducible representation in the Hilbert space. Whenever such an algebra acts on the Hilbert space, it always commutes with another algebra of the same type, either type two or type three. For example, we constructed our type two and type three algebras as algebras of operators on the A part of a bipartite system AB. So they commuted with an identical algebra on system B. The difference between type two and type three, as I've already indicated, is that a type two algebra has a trace and a type three algebra does not. Moreover, in a type two algebra, the trace is non-degenerate in the sense that the bilinear form given by saying that the inner product of A and B is the trace of AB is non-degenerate and positive definite. From the non-degeneracy, it follows that if f of a is any linear function, it's equal to the trace of a times b for some b in the algebra. So that's an important fact that we'll use in a moment. Now let's go back to the situation considered by Sorkin. We consider some state of the whole universe, sorry. Suppose it were true that the physics in region A is described by a type two algebra, curly A. In quantum field theory, it's false, but suppose it were true. Then the linear function that takes A to its exponential value in the, in the state psi would be, as I said before, the trace of A times B for some B, but now I will call B, I will write it as rho sub A. So the exponential value of A in the state psi would be the trace of A times something, and that something deserves to be called the density matrix, since that's the terminology we use in type one. So in type one, we would use this, this condition as the definition of the density matrix. So what I've just told you is that density matrices also exist for type two, because the type two algebra has a trace, non-degenerate trace. So we'll call row A the density matrix also in the type two situation. And once we have density matrices, we can define entropies. So entropies are well-defined for type two. So if the region outside the horizon is described by a type two algebra, then we can define an entropy for this region. Now, as I've already mentioned in ordinary quantum field theory, the algebras of regions are type three. But it turns out that when we include gravity, things are different. Gravitational effects, even for very weak coupling, convert the type three algebras into type two algebras. The mathematical mechanisms that lead to this are quite simple and have long been known by operator theorists. They were, the facts we need are discovered by people like Kahn and Takasaki among others just about half a century ago, by coincidence, just in the early days of black hole thermodynamics, these things were also being discovered. What's new is only that these mechanisms are actually implemented by perturbative gravity in the field of a black hole or de Sitter space. The details are different in the two cases, and I will only have time for very brief explanations. <clears throat> I'm going to draw one more Penrose diagram. This is a Penrose diagram for the short shield black hole, maximally extended in an asymptotically flat space time. As was discovered by um, Kreskel and Sequeiros, among others, there actually are the, the black hole solution is really a wormhole between two different asymptotically flat worlds. There's an A region at spatial infinity, and there's a B region at spatial infinity. And we're going to take the regions A and B as being the regions A and B in Sorkin's picture. I've drawn it in space time. If to draw it in space as I was doing previously, I would draw an initial value surface and then just talk about what's on that surface. But I think I'm going to switch to a space time picture. So A and B are now space time regions, namely the regions, the region of causal development 
from the spatial region A and B. So the black hole is a wormhole that connects two asymptotically flat universes, our two systems A and B. Excuse me? Yes, uh, there was a question in the chat. How can we interpret this in terms of ADSFT? Does it mean that the ADS gravity of finite n and lambda is always of type three? Well, the, the question is slightly easier technical to answer properly now, but um, my original paper on the black hole was about the ADS case. So if you want to see the details for the ADS case, I recommend looking at that paper. Uh, more recently, it was understood uh, okay, in the second paper I mentioned at the beginning by Chandra Sekharan, Longo, Pennington, and me. Uh, we gave it, a derivation that is the one I'm about to give you for the asymptotically flat case. Now, in low energy effective field theory, we'd construct a Hilbert space H for the black hole space time. For any field other than the gravitational field, H is acted on by left and right algebras A and B that are of type three. Curly A would be the algebra of observables in region A and curly B is the algebra of observables here. There's a subtlety about constructing the Hilbert space for the gravitational field, even in the weak coupling limit. Almost all the construction proceeds similarly to what we would get for any other field. And we get a Hilbert space H naught acted on by type three algebras A naught and B naught. But there are two canonically conjugate modes of gravity that would not have an analog for any other field. One of them describes a fluctuation in the mass of the black hole. And the other one is its canonical conjugate. It's a fluctuation in the time measured on one side relative to the time measured on the other side. So there are two extra operators, X and P, which are canonically conjugate and which don't really have close analogs if you were quantizing any other field. Since they're conjugate, when you quantize them, you get a new Hilbert space L2 of R of functions of X, X axis multiplication and P axis differentiation. The combined Hilbert space is therefore not what you would have if gravity was like any other field, which I've called H naught, the combined Hilbert space is more like H naught centered L2 of R. The combined, the physical Hilbert space, including these two extra modes, is just slightly bigger than you'd have if you treated gravity as any other field. Now, what are the operators accessible to the observer in region A outside the black hole horizon? Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to go for this far back. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll just briefly sketch the picture again then since I can't find it. So we have region A and region B. What can an observer in region A measure? Well, the region observer in region A can measure the algebra A naught of operators on the naive Hilbert space, that's a type three algebra. But the observer at infinity also has access to one more operator, which is simply the total energy, the ADM energy, HR, measured at infinity to the right of the horizon. So way off at infinity, you measure the ADM mass, which I'm calling HR. You can show that this operator acts on the combined Hilbert space as a sum of two terms. The operator X mapped X on L2 of R. And there's another term which involves, uh, well, I used a fancy language here, but involves the time translation symmetry of the black hole. So H, after all, the Hamiltonian generates time translations. So H hat generates the killing vector field of the Schwarzschild space time, which is associated to time translations. In short, the difference between ordinary quantum field theory in the field of a black hole and gravity 
is that we have to slightly enlarge the Hilbert space by adding just this little extra bit. And we have to add one more operator to the algebra. So it doesn't sound like much, but in mathematical terms, we've discovered a construction that's actually quite important in the theory of binomial algebras. Enlarging the Hilbert space like this and adding one more operator like this gives us what's called the cross product A of the type three algebra A naught by its modular automorphism group. And according to celebrated results from the early 70s, it means that the algebra A is of type two infinity. And in particular, it has a trace and a notion of density matrix or entropy. Concretely, we can write a formula for the trace. Oh. We can write it, but I see that I have a misprint. I'm trying to remove that symbol. Uh, an element of the algebra is a function of h over beta plus x that's valued in operators in the naive algebra. So here's a rather general element of the algebra. Its trace is given by this rather explicit formula. But to explain where that formula comes from and why it satisfies the property of a trace takes some explanation. If you want details, you should look at the first of the two papers that I mentioned at the beginning. So there's a natural notion of density matrix and entropy for the observer outside the black hole horizon. And it's possible to show that up to an undefined additive constant independent of the state, the entropy agrees with the Bekenstein proposal, the generalized entropy. Something rather similar happens in De Sitter space. Here's the setup. The green region, as I said before, is called a static patch. There's a killing vector field of time translations that future directed time like in the static patch. It's past directed time like in this complementary static patch over here. Let H be the generator of the time translation symmetry of the static patch. In ordinary quantum field theory, we dissociate a Hilbert space H naught to the Sitter space and a type three algebra A naught of operators in the static patch that acts on this Hilbert space. However, the Sitter space is a closed universe because the spatial sections are compact. And in a closed universe, the isometries have to be treated as constraints. That means we should replace A naught by A naught H, the invariant subalgebra. But that doesn't work. The way operator theorists say it is that the modular automorphism group acts trivially and A naught H is trivial, uh, acts ergodically, sorry, and A naught H is trivial. A more informal explanation is that if we average over all the thermal fluctuations to get an operator that commutes with the Hamiltonian, the operator we get is just a C number. The only way to get a reasonable answer is to include the observer in the analysis. As a minimal model of the observer, we consider a clock with a Hamiltonian that I'll call X. Physically, it's reasonable to assume the observer's energy is bounded below by zero. So we assume X is non-negative. So the effect of including the observer is to make the Hilbert space slightly bigger than it was before. We replace the naive Hilbert space H naught by H naught tensored with L2 of R plus. Or at least that's one effect of including the observer. R plus is the half line of non-negative X. The algebra, the naive algebra is likewise extended. We have a quantum field theory algebra of type three, but we should include all the observers operators, which I will assume, I assume that the observer can manipulate the clock in an arbitrary fashion so that the observers operators are the bounded algebra of all, sorry, the algebra of all bounded operators on L2 of R plus. Anyway, without details, the 
we, we have the quantum field theory algebra, but we also have additional operators that the observer has. Finally, the constraint becomes the total Hamiltonian of the quantum fields plus the observer. So the constraint is not the old constraint H, it's H plus the Hamiltonian of the observer or H hat. The cracked algebra of observables taking account of the presence of the observer is therefore not this A1 that I defined here, including the observer's operators. It's rather the H hat invariant part of A1. And unlike the naive definition we had before, this one actually works and gives a sensible answer. Essentially by Takasaki duality, although you can, you can write very down to earth formulas to explain this. This algebra is of type 2, 1, which means it has a notion of density matrix entropy. And because the algebra is now of type 2, 1 rather than type 2 infinity, there's actually a state of maximum entropy. That state corresponds to the natural de Sitter state, sometimes called the bunch Davy state. The density matrix of the maximum entropy state is one, so that this state has a flat entanglement spectrum, as was first predicted by Euclidean path integral. And one can reproduce ideas developed by Banks, Susskind, and others. And more generally, facts known from gravity can be recovered from the type two algebra, although I don't have time to explain all that today. I should stress something I haven't had time to explain. Entropy defined this way is really defined up to an overall additive constant that's independent of the state. This is analogous to entropy in classical physics, which is defined up to an additive constant by the first law. So classical physicists didn't have any way to fix the absolute zero of entropy. And in this type two discussion, we're in a similar situation. We can define entropy differences between different states, but there's an ill-defined overall constant. To conclude, we've learned that at the level of semi-classical gravity, one can define an algebra A such that the generalized entropy in the presence of a black hole or cosmological horizon is the entropy of a state of the algebra. Although what I explained is less, I only explained that at the level of semi-classical gravity, it's possible to define an algebra whose entropies make sense. It's a further story that I haven't really had time for to explain that the entropy of a state of the algebra is the generalized entropy of Bekenstein up to a state independent constant. This algebra does not have pure states. So at this level, there is no notion of a black hole microstate. Thank you. Okay, so thank you for the nice talk and great talk. And are there any questions or comments about this? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, like what if you have multiple observers in the Decider's case and the Decider case, and if the Hamiltonians don't commute with each other, does that change things? Well, the only thing I will be able to say is the following. We look at things from the point of view of one observer. The, the algebra we defined is observer dependent. And what it describes are observations that can be made by that observer. So if there are different observers, they can observe different things. They have different horizons, for example. So each observer will have his or her own horizon algebra. And from the point of view of any one observer, the algebra describes everything that might exist in the sitter space. And another observer, if there is one, is just an example of what there might be. So in this discussion, a second observer, if present, is just part of the matter described by the algebra. The but situation is symmetrical between the two observers. What the second would observer would have a different algebra with the first as part of the matter system. In that case, uh, how would you how would a similar thing uh, work out in the black hole case? Because if you have x and p multiple x and x's and p's which don't commute with well, each other. In the black hole case, well, the different okay. 
first of all, in the black hole case, we're really studying the world as seen by an observer at, at infinity. And it doesn't matter exactly where the observer at infinity is. So for example, we observe gravitational waves coming from a black hole. Effectively, we're at infinity. But somebody in Andromeda might have observed the same black hole. That's another observer at infinity. In the case of a black hole, unless you consider extreme things, like observers with constant acceleration, any observer who stays outside the black hole is equivalent to any other. They all experience the same horizon. To sitter space is completely different. The horizon is a completely observer-dependent notion. There's no invariantly defined horizon into sitter space as there is for a black hole. So you have to expect the, the observer to play a role for the sitter space that doesn't have such a direct analog for the black hole. X and P, going back to the case of the black hole, the X and P for the black hole were not characteristic of, of any observer. One of them was a fluctuation in the black hole area, and the other is a fluctuation in the time measured on one side relative to the other. They were not. For the De Sitter space, we introduced the observer to get X and P, but that was not the case for the black hole. Okay, so we have uh, some questions from the chatting. So uh, the first question is, is the thermodynamical field double a good description of black hole in the dead space? In the zero space? Yeah. Um, well, We don't understand the sitter space as well as we understand anti sitter space or the black hole. Um, so uh, what, what is making me hesitate is that I don't have a fundamental quantum mechanical description to use for the sitter space. So uh, I, I'm going to just say maybe. It depends on understanding the sitter space better. Mm -hmm. Okay. One question, is it possible to make a purification of the density matrix to get a pure state? If a state has non-zero entropy, you can get a pure state in a bigger Hilbert space, but not in the original Hilbert space. Nothing uh, has to the algebra. The, why did, okay. the most interesting question here is why does a type two and type three algebra not have pure states? Can I ask you a question? Well, I want that question was interesting, so I want to try to answer it or at least say a word about it. Okay, it's ex perhaps I, sorry, I have trouble answering in a completely non technical way. Uh, I think if you look, there's an introduction to type two algebras at the beginning of the second paper, the one with Chandrasekhar on it and others. If you look there, I think it'll help you understand the absence of pure states for a type two algebra. Uh, go ahead with the other question. Uh, so if all the problem of a quantum field theory is coming from the divergence and, uh, uh, and uh, you are suggesting that the gravity introduces some regularization. Yes. And then what is the uh, uh, better, uh, I mean, what if we just, uh, I mean, the regularize the uh, quantum field theory by putting it on the lattice and the, uh, why gravity, is there any particularly um, interesting aspect for the gravity, uh, which is better than the just a lattice sizing or finite, making theory just a finite in any other method? It depends on whether you want to study gravity. If you're mm -hmm. interested in black holes, then, uh, that's fundamentally relativistic, so it's going to be hard to reproduce black hole physics with a lattice. And you'll be studying lattice artifacts. The beauty is that gravity naturally, for this specific question of the entropy, gravity naturally eliminates the divergence, leading mm -hmm. to a, a generalized entropy that's well defined. And so, and the, uh, okay. So, so finally, 
your procedure can be applied to any uh, gravity background with some isometry? I don't want to claim too much. I only understand what to say for the sitter space or the black hole. I would like to not have to use an isometry, by the way. The most optimistic statement along these general lines is that in any space time with a horizon, any observer who can't see the whole universe would always describe, the observations of such an observer can always describe, be described by a type two algebra. I don't know if that's true, but that's the most optimistic uh, hypothesis. What Hawking said was that an observer who can't see the whole universe has the density matrix rather than a, a, a Hilbert space state. Well, to make Hawking's statement literally true, the algebra of observables accessible to that observer should be of type two. I Thank have you. a personal question and uh, uh, maybe off topic. I've heard you studied physics since old age uh, as a master course student in well, old I, age. I think I we should stick, if you don't mind, let's try to stick with the black holes in thermodynamics today. I think uh, that's a little bit too far off topic. Sorry for that. Our other question from the, the chatting is, is that, uh, is it possible to make a purification of the density matrix to get a pure state? And what happens to the algebra in the purification map? Well, nothing happens to the algebra. What it means to purify a density matrix is to, to introduce a bigger Hilbert space. The mm -hmm. same algebra acts on the bigger Hilbert space. So it's true that a density matrix, as we did in the lecture for the a thermal density matrix, a density matrix can be always regarded as the density matrix of some pure state on some bigger system. To do that, we introduce some other Hilbert space that's not part of our system. Well, we do nothing to the, it does nothing, literally nothing to the algebra of observables accessible to a given observer. I was unhappy with one of my answers uh, to a question asked during the lecture. When I was, okay. I just would like to stress that, yes, it's true Hawking discovered the factor of one quarter, but the more important thing Hawking did was to discover that Bekenstein was correct. Bekenstein's idea of black hole entropy was a wild guess before Hawking's calculation was done. As a result, of, in the course of learning that Bekenstein had been correct, Hawking also learned that the constant was one quarter. But what Hawking really did was to discover that Bekenstein had been correct. Okay, uh, another question from the chatting is that, uh, do you, I mean, how do you think about uh, the ideas that the Einstein gravity equation is a kind of the entanglement first law? There hasn't been a very tangible proposal. There isn't anything concrete enough that I understand it and can say anything about it. Okay, other questions? I have a question. Uh, can, you, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, uh, I have a question. I mean, uh, can I see the uh, introduce of Vanilla algebra as a way to renormalization of the entropy. I think. Well, Sorry. we didn't introduce the Van Neumann algebra by hand. What we found was that gravity spontaneously cracks the type three algebra into a type two algebra. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so and so 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 I mean, is it uh? Can, can I see is a way to renormalization because you say the, uh, well, the, the, the black hole entropy is divergent. And if we uh, plus the black hole entropy and it's odd, then we can get a finite entropy. So I want to know if can I see is a way to, uh, uh, to, to, 
animate the directions of the entropy. So we, we, we want to get a finite yeah. entropy. Yeah. <clears throat> Look, the work of people like Beckenstein and Hawking mm. and then Susskind and Oakland make it fairly clear that black hole entropy in the real world is physically meaningful and finite. Yeah, yeah. So we've gotten a little bit closer in this lecture to understanding why that's true. The, yeah, the, obstruction, I, I, to, the obstruction to it being true is the ultraviolet divergence in quantum field theory. And we've learned Gotten, we've gotten a somewhat abstract explanation of why gravity improves the situation. Uh, so, so yes, so I mean, you give a, a mathematical series fundamental to this result. Yes? Yes. Yes, yeah, thank you. Okay, so uh, as of the final the, the request, uh, some people asked you to show the reference shown in your know, the first the, the, uh, the transparency, I mean, this is the PowerPoint, so that I mean, people can learn uh, where we should look, I mean, your paper, so maybe. Well, it's, I don't know an efficient way to go back to the beginning of all these slides, um, but you'll easily find the papers if you look for it. Um, one paper, I mean, I mentioned two paper of my own papers, one with co-authors. One has De Sitter in the title and one has Gravity in the title. So mm -hmm. uh, there are two of my last three papers, uh, two okay. of my last three or four papers. Mm -hmm. So you'll easily find them, I'm sure. Okay, so. so sorry, I have a one, one, one naive question. So since type two algebra doesn't allow Pure state, how can I understand, how can you understand the page curve? Can you understand the page curve? Well, um, the page curve is necessary to get a pure state, but not sufficient. But so entropic, after you will, does it come back to pure state? Well, I have not solved, in this lecture, I've not solved the black hole information problem. I haven't proved that, I haven't said anything really about black hole evaporation. Uh, I've merely given a new perspective on why gravity yes, makes entropy well defined. Yes, I understand. So, mm. um, defining entropy is much less than knowing that I black see. hole evaporation is unitary. But um, and the, but I do want to also point out to you that the calculations of the page curve depend on being able to define and calculate entropy. But having a page curve doesn't by itself tell you that you had a pure state. Mm. Okay, I think I'm... If you could follow it all the way literally down to zero entropy, then yes. But the calculations really show it go, the curve goes up and then goes down. But Yeah, I think this is okay. Go ahead. No, I mean, it's okay. Okay, so I think, I mean, this is the good time to wrap it up. So I think I mean, we should uh, thank the, the speaker, Amir Dudwitsun again. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you again for the invitation and for the discussion. But be well, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Very much. Thank, thank you very much, Professor Edward Witten. Oh, certainly. Thank you again. Yeah, bye. Bye.